At this point, we're going to actually get into the mechanics of the game. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail. I'll kind of give you a little overview of how the shooting and the close combat works. Just a rough overview of it all. Uh, after the game turn, in chapter 4, and again, this chapter here really describes in detail how the each phase of the turn works. Uh, breaking down each phase. It then goes into chapter 5, which is all about impetus and so on and so forth. Uh, the command phase, how it's done, the basics of it. Uh, and then it goes into how you activate platoons and combat groups. Uh, and basically, when you do activate them, there's like five, I believe, different orders you can give them, which last the entire combat phase for your side. And it's basically things like... Uh, they can do fire. They can do a tactical move. They could do a tactical move and fire. They could also do a tactical move and recon or fall back. There's also a rapid advance, which is kind of like moving uh, double time uh, if you're playing other games. There's a rally order. There's a withdrawal where you pull your troops back. Uh, there's an option to give an order of coordinated infantry assault. Uh, which basically allows you to activate more than one group of uh, troops, like platoons or combat groups, and uh, close combat with more troops. So that's what that order does. There's also a human wave. Uh, now this costs one extra impetus when you do choose to use this order, and you do want to activate them successfully, you have to pay an extra HQ impetus point to even do this order. And it's the same thing with the coordinated infantry assault. They demand more from your command resources, basically. Uh, so then it goes into the actual spotting and reconnaissance, because remember, this set of rules does use hidden deployment and hidden movement, so you have to acquire your targets uh, and spot them and see what they are and get them revealed on the table. Here's a section that talks about the distances uh, that you can actually acquire targets. I mean, maybe you can shoot across the table, but if they're too far away to see, uh, you can't really target them and shoot them. And that's what this little table is all about. Maximum target acquisition distances. Uh, for instance, you'd look up the spotter type, infantry, AFV, or gun, and the target is infantry or small guns. If they're in cover, it's 18 inches. If they're in the open, it's 24. If the target is an AFV, gun, or vehicle, uh, it's 36 inches if the target is in cover, 48 if it's in the open. So this is the distances you can acquire them, which means that's how far away... Uh, you can shoot a target of that type. And it goes into more detail about that. And there's a reconnaissance, of course, where you can recon areas which you suspect enemy to be located. Uh, and then it goes into movement. And I believe after that it talks about terrain, uh, movement effects of terrain, and cover. It defines it and so on and so forth. Uh, and then I believe it goes into shooting in chapter 10. You got your direct fire. Uh, let's see here. Kind of talks about arcs of fire, the range. Um, describes the different weapon types that each base or stand of troops represents, like rifle sections. You got assault rifle sections, submachine gun sections, light machine gun sections, medium machine gun sections, light mortars, anti tank rifle sections, uh, anti-tank sections, tank hunter sections, flamethrowers, and then it goes into uh, armored fighting vehicle weapons and their guns, uh, and so on and so forth. Plenty of detail for any uh, World War II grognard here. Uh, let's see what else we got in this book. Now, at this point, I th there is an option for low ammo. If you roll bad enough, you can end up having your powerful guns, anyway, uh, being marked as low ammo, or even out of ammo. That's a fun little add to the game. I like that. Uh, at this point, I think we're going to talk about the actual mechanics of fire. Just real quick, basically, how uh, firing with your tanks and your infantry works. Basically, without getting into too much detail, as I said before, this is a simple system of you roll 2d6 and you're after a target number. Now, your role will be modified by various circumstances and the quality and training of your troops and the weapon systems involved. So there's some modifiers. And typically, to hit, you need to score at least a 6. Now, the better you roll, the more effective your shot will be. And you see, what you do is that once you acquire a hit, which again is 6 plus, you take that result, the final result of the modified die roll, and you consult a table, which basically is a 
the type of morale check your target will have to take. Now, it doesn't matter if the target is a tank or if it's infantry or whatever. It still takes an effect that's basically a check on a morale table. And he'll make a roll on that to see what actually happens. It could be they break and they're removed from the table. They could be suppressed and they can't shoot in the next turn. Or they can't move except to pull back. Or it could be a, a lot of different results. In the case of vehicles, uh, they could also be damaged through this roll. Uh, in which case they'll be penalized when they try and shoot because they're marked as damaged. Uh, normally a tank is taken out of the game and considered destroyed when it takes two damage uh, hits uh, results. Uh, that's basically how the shooting system and mechanics work, and it's kind of similar with close assault as well, in close combat. Uh, there is some differences though, uh, like for instance when you're shooting anti-tank weapons, like say I'm using a bazooka against a tank, or say a Sherman is firing on a Panzer IV, you know, anti-tank fire. Uh, you basically roll your 2d6, modify it, and so on, just as normal. However, there's one additional step before you go to that results table, which causes a morale check on the target. And what it is, with, uh, is you, with your result, after it's modified, add the armor penetration of your weapon. Like, for instance, maybe it's four, maybe it's five. You add that to your result. Now, deduct from that the armor of the target. Like, say it's, it's, it's the front armor of a Sherman, which is four. You deduct four from that total. Uh, the higher, the better. The more likely you are to take that enemy tank out or force you know, harsh results on it when it makes its test. Uh, that's how that works. So there's an additional step there where you take into account the armor penetration of the weapon system that hit and the armor of the target based on the side that's hit. For instance, it could be its side armor or it could be its front. Um, that's how that works. Uh, Off-board artillery and on-board artillery as well. This game system caters to both. So if you have lots of artillery models from Flames of War, you can use them. Put them on the table and they work the same similar way. Uh, with that, it's basically you observe a target, usually with an observer or a command headquarters uh, section. Spot a target. You roll for availability of the artillery uh, if the battery's guns are available. Uh, if they are, you roll again uh, to see how accurate your shot is, which can result in anything from, oh, it's a complete miss and does nothing, it deviates and hits your own troops, or it's spot on and just does a devastating fire for effect. Uh, once it is got targets under it, you take the template and you check it out. If there's any targets under it, you're going to roll again on the fire for effect. And this is basically where you take into account a 2d6 roll. You add modifiers for the <clears throat> gun factor. And it, it'll basically cause any units under the template to take those little morale checks that we talked about before. Which can, re again, result in them being broken or destroyed or... Uh, suppressed and so on and so forth. So that's how artillery works as well. So you can see it's it's kind of a similar mechanic where you're after that target number to hit, you roll 2d6, modify it, uh, and then the higher the result, the better you will be when you check for the actual effect that the target makes a roll for, um, typically a morale check. Um, and that's basically how it works. And then, like I said, it's it's similar with close assaults. So yeah, that's the basic mechanics of combat. Uh, chapter 17 talks about smoke screens. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, so we do have smoke uh, covered in these rules, as well as air attacks, which uh, are very abstracted. They're basically, they come onto the table and the same similar results as off-board artillery. So you can have these playing a role in your battles as well, if you've got lots of airplanes. And then chapter 19 goes into the exploit phase. Uh, and so on and so forth. And that's about it. There's the rallying phase, how it works. Explanation of the breakpoint in chapter 21. Uh, and here's something nice. We've got scenarios. The book does include, I believe, about three scenarios. Uh, they got a nice map here. This one's called St. Nicholas's Farm. And you got your little orders of battle, the forces, the missions, the breakpoints, and so on. Any special rules like artillery that might be in, available to both sides. And yeah, there you go. That's scenario one. Scenario two, uh, similar. You got German and U.S. forces going at it. Nice little map. And finally, a Stalingrad uh, 
scenario, 1942, same little situation. So you do get scenarios with this game. Uh, and here in chapter 23, it talks about optional rules. And this game is, game is great for adding your own optional rules as well. But everything from dummy positions like tanks with fake barrels and things like that, uh, representing early war Russian commissars. Uh, let's see. Here's a rule that allows suppressed sections. Now remember, if a unit could be suppressed, it really can't do anything except fall back. You have to rally it to get it to do something. But here's an option that allows the unit that's suppressed to actually defensive fire if it's close assaulted. Uh, so that gives them a little bit of protection for themselves. Uh, Russian open and opening bombardments. Special rules for artillery for the British and U.S. Uh, naval gunfire support. That's nice. Uh, River crossings, boats, demolition charges. Now, here's a section here, chapter 24, that I really appreciate with any set of rules, and it's designer notes. This is something I really look for in any set of rules. It's, it's when, a, when an author of a set of rules puts designer notes in his rules, it really helps you to understand some of the ideas behind the rules. And I should add that throughout this rule book, there are sections where the author takes the time to actually explain uh, the reasoning behind some of the rules. Like, for instance, here, uh, the spotting rationale. Uh, here's the author's notes regarding spotting in the rules. And it's a extensive little section, which gives you a reason why he is doing the rules the way he's doing them. This kind of stuff I really enjoy and appreciate from an author in a set of rules. So kudos for that. That's a nice touch. And finally, after the designer notes, we get into setting up a game. This is all about points. Uh, if you want to use a point system in Army List, you can do that. It's a very simple point system, not complex. Uh, basically, your, your unit types have a basic point value, and that's it. Sometimes there's a modifier, like for troop grading. Uh, and that's about it. And it gives you suggestions for the size of battles and how many points to apply and the table size for each one. As well as some notes here to represent attackers and defenders, like uh, if one side is the defender, he should have like 25% less troops and so on and so forth. Little things like that. So here you are. Perfect little section. Then it's got point costs for your basic unit types. This first section of the army lists. Uh, basically basic types of units that are typical. Uh, in this case for German infantry, uh, it gives you uh, the options that you can take for each thing. Here we got infantry platoon, regulars. Gives you their point value, 95 points. And uh, it tells you what it's made up of. Down here you can add various things like support weapons and things to it. So. You can build your armies based on these alone. Uh, and then it does the same thing with the British. As you can see, the Russians. It's got the United States, of course. And those are the main forces involved there. Uh, then it goes into the equipment tables, talks about the different vehicles, and, uh, pack 40s, and all this stuff, all their stats in the game. Uh, like, for instance, we got a Tiger 1. Its gun type is 88 millimeter. Uh, its armor is rated as B, its speed is S, which stands for small. Uh, hmm, that's not right. I uh, can't remember what that stands for. It's not slow, that's what it is, sorry. S is for slow. M is for uh, medium speed. Uh, let's see what else we have here for this. We have the year it was brought in, which is 42, and its cost, 200 points. That's a pretty pricey tank, as you'd expect. British, Russians, United States. Then it's got equipment for the Poland, France, Italy, and Japan. Little tag on at the back. Now here, we've got an even more useful section. Now this is close to the end of the book, and this is your tables of organization, 44 to 45. This actually gives you orders of battle, the basic orders of battle, and the notes for each one are extremely useful. Uh, for example, the German battalion-sized formations. You got grenadier battalions, fusilier battalions, motorized Panzer grenadier battalions, Volksgrenadier battalions, Fallschirmjäger battalions. 
uh, basically tells you how they're organized, how many companies, what, how, what was in each company, what the support units were, and so on and so forth. And plenty of notes which add historical elements to the organization here. Uh, like it might mention specific divisions. Uh, like for instance here it mentions uh, the 21st Panzer Division in Normandy had two armored Panzer Grenadier battalions, but the majority only had a single armored Panzer Grenadier battalion. Little notes like this. Uh, so these are basically uh, for you to make your own scenarios and your own army lists. Uh, and there are some suggestions if you want to use this. I believe it says, for instance, uh, pick a battalion and you have to take at least two companies from this battalion. And a third company can be taken from any other battalion on your side. I think that's the basics if you want to use a point system with these uh, tables of organization. I believe that's described right here. And that's basically how that works. And it covers the, all these German forces. It goes into the British, of course, you got parachute battalions, quite a few British. And then it goes into the Soviets, the Russians, obviously they're in the red. Then the U.S. battle groups or battalions, same kind of thing. And that's it. So there you go, folks. That is the book in a nutshell. So there you go, folks. That's Panzer Grenadier uh, Deluxe. Uh, as far as what I think about it, my final thoughts, whether or not you should uh, make the expense on buying this set of rules and by the way, this set of rules is available. Uh, you can get it here in the United States from on military matters. Uh, I believe it's uh, anywhere from fifty to sixty dollars, and it's kind of steep in price. You are getting a high quality product here, though, like I pointed out earlier. Uh, but as far as the actual gameplay of the game and what I think about it, uh, I definitely think there's a learning curve to it, especially if you've never played World War II games before. Uh, the only downside to this game, though. Now, I, I have to say, this is a set of rules that's not difficult to play. It's very easy and fast-moving. Uh, but when it comes to learning the game, uh, especially if you're new to World War II gaming, uh, there is a lot of page flipping. And I think one of the reasons for that is that a lot of the subjects are broken up into multiple chapters. Like, for instance, shooting might be broken up into several chapters. Um, whatever the topic is, and there's a lot of page flipping back and forth to get to the relevant information. Uh, that's probably the only issue I had when I was first learning this game. Uh, it's not a difficult to play game though. Once you've had about six, seven, eight turns in the game, it goes really quick and you catch on real quick. Uh, I think it's mainly geared for historical players uh, interested in recreating historical battles. Uh, it's not a set of rules for tournament players. Uh, and as a result, it's, it, it, it's, there's a lot of open to interpretation rules in this uh, rule book, uh, which is not a bad thing. That's actually good, particularly if you're of the historical bent, because you can, you know, interpret things the way you want, change things the way you want, and add things the way you want, which is basically my style of play, actually. I, I appreciate that with a set of rules. I like to tinker. I like to put my stint on things if I don't think the rules cover it well. Uh, but yeah, I think overall it's a fast-moving game, uh, not difficult to play, a little bit of a learning curve if you've never played World War II games before, especially uh, if you're an experienced war gamer, it's really easy to learn because you can make up your own things and you kind of know. I think the author uh, makes a few assumptions that you have some knowledge of uh, war gaming when you play this. It's not bad at all, uh, and I do recommend this set of rules if you enjoy the historical side of gaming. Uh, it's fun. It's definitely fun. Uh, I enjoyed the games I had. There were some very nail-biting moments in the, the games that I have played. Uh, I enjoy quite a few elements of the game. I really appreciate the command and control aspects of this game. And I think that's probably the biggest highlight of this set of rules is the command and control rules. The use of impetus and headquarters impetus. Uh, trying to get your units to do things. Uh, because you're never certain. You can have all these units on the table, 
But unlike other games, you can't just assume that you're going to be able to do anything with those units. You have to make that die roll to activate them and then decide what you're going to do with them. And in some cases, you're going to have to have impetus uh, to spend to get those guys to do what you want them to do, uh, to basically activate. And I enjoy that aspect of the game uh, immensely. The combat rules, the shooting, the off-board artillery, and on-board artillery, it's all pretty standard, nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. Uh, like I said, it's, it's part of the General the Brigade family, so there's elements to this set of rules that are familiar if you've played any of those other games, like rolling double sixes, uh, and also double ones in this game. All kinds of interesting things can happen. Tanks can run out of ammo or whatever, you know, all kinds of fun things. And that makes it quite enjoyable, too. Uh, I do recommend the set of rules. Uh, you can get this United States uh, from On Military Matters. And I believe it goes from anywhere from 50 to $60. So it is kind of pricey, but I think it's worthwhile. So definitely recommend to anyone with an interest in the historical side of World War II gaming. Uh, if you're a tournament player, this might not be for you. Uh, if you like a lot of granular detail in your games, uh, this set of rules might not be for you either. It goes into detail, but not immensely. I know there's other rules out there that do that. Uh, this does not, but it gives you just enough detail to have a really good, fun, tactical feeling game uh, of World War II. So there you go, folks. I do recommend this set of rules, and I hope you enjoyed this little review. It's kind of long, but... It, I tried to cover as much as I could. If you have any questions about this set of rules, leave me a comment, uh, like, uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, let me know what you think, and if you have any more ideas about what you'd like to see me review, uh, please feel free to comment and let me know, because that's, that's why I'm doing these videos. So there you go, folks. Panzer Grenadier Deluxe. It's a pretty good set of rules, and I do recommend it. Take care.